This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Hi, everybody. Well, um, today's talk is entitled Something Lived and Something Dreamed, and it's about a celebration of abundance. I think what we're looking at is the idea that if the human species is the dominant species, that there's this opportunity we have by design to execute our intentions in ways that uh, evidence uh, intelligent life. And perhaps we could celebrate the abundance of the sun instead of bemoaning our limits on fossil fuels. We could celebrate the abundance of materials instead of bemoaning our limits to materials and their toxification potentials and, and um, unoptimized flows and things like that. So this is a, a celebration of the abundance of the world. And it's something lived because we, we live it every day and we do our best to, to deal with it by design. And it's something dreamed because we're dreaming of a future that is different. I'm going to just quickly mention a few enterprises that I'm part of so you get a sense of what, what I do. Uh, I work with an architectural practice, William McDonough and Partners, which is where I spend most of my time uh, as an architect. I also have a company, McDonough Browngart Design Chemistry, which I've co-founded with my co-author, Michael Browngart, and we do chemical assessments of products and systems and do optimizations based on ecological and human health. Um, I consult to various uh, CEOs and uh, give spe speeches and things like that under McDonough Consulting. And then finally, uh, since we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship and venture, I'm a uh, a partner at uh, Vantage Point Venture Partners, which is a $5 billion venture fund uh, with uh, about a billion dollars being allocated toward uh, clean technology investments. So this is uh, the framework uh, with, within which I operate on a daily basis. But what I really see myself as is a designer, and I like to think of design as the first signal of human intention. Now I've come here from Charlottesville, Virginia, where I've had the privilege of living in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. And I was the dean at the University of Virginia School of Architecture from 1994 till 1999. And as, as the dean, I was able to live in this house on the lawn at the university and have Mr. Jefferson as my architect. Now, when you have Thomas Jefferson as your architect, you wake up in the morning thinking about space differently because you think about his astonishing design for this academical village that is the University of Virginia with its grounds and its buildings. And you realize that Mr. Jefferson saw himself as a designer too, because if you look at his last design, you'll notice that on it, he only recorded the things he designed. It's his tombstone, it's at Monticello, and on it, he recorded Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which matured into the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia. That's it. Anything missing? Can you imagine being president of the United States twice and it's not important enough to put on your tombstone? What he was recording were his legacies, not his activities. He was recording the things he left behind, not the job descriptions that he held. And this idea that we would have intentions for our seventh generation, it's interesting that the people in this room could be considered Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. The idea that we could have designs that, go, that would manifest themselves in seven generations is not something unfamiliar to our culture. It's not unfamiliar to indigenous culture. But it does beg the question at this point in our history, what is our intention as a species? Because we are the dominant species. 99% of the large mammals on the planet are under human management. We see changes in the world that are being wrought by human activity. Uh, we can even affect uh, climate. And so the question has to become, what is our intention as a species? Because if we intended to pollute the rivers, to destroy the air quality, to cause climate change, and so on and so forth, then we're doing great. <laughs> if that's not the plan, what is the plan? Because right now, we're suffering under a de facto plan. We all come together as best we can, but when we come, we pollute. Uh, and, and we get to, to, together to talk about pollution and other things. And, and we realize that it's intrinsic in the design of our systems that we cause these, these deleterious effects. And so what is our new design? What is our intention? What is our dream? So what would the first question be 
Well, the first question that we ask in our offices is how do we love all the children of all species for all time? And it's not just our children, and it's not just our species, and it's not just now. How do we love all the children of all species for all time? Now, this is an emotional uh, framework, but it also begs a specific uh, technological goal. And so I tried to put the goal into one sentence. I had to get a poet to help me with the punctuation, because it's a long sentence. Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. Now, what part of this don't we like? And what we realize is that we have a new goal that can be explicit, and our designs can, can start to move in this direction. And this idea that it would be delightful, it would be diverse, safe, healthy, and just, and elegantly enjoyed, I think, is fundamental to, to uh, the prospects of, of the human species. Now, we have been somewhere, historically, between socialism and capitalism in a social market economy, depending on where you are in the world. And what we've realized is that any ism is a dangerous thing, typically. You know, socialism, fascism, Nazism, capitalism, any ism as an extreme position is, hasn't been good for the environment, certainly. Because if we look at a pure capitalist, we cut down the trees and forget the fish. If we look at pure socialism, we see that the former USSR, by some accounts, has been declared 16% uninhabitable. It's called ecocide. 16% uninhabitable. So anything that's this extreme is, is, is problematic. Now, there's a third ism that has been brought to the picture, which is ecologism. And in its extreme form is ecologism. It would be just as radical a position relative to capital and social uh, requirements. And so what we're really looking for is a balance of all these energies toward a design that meets capital need, social need, and ecological need. And in fact, if we look for a delightfully diverse response, we can develop a protocol that allows us to look at the three uh, legs of sustainable development, economy, equity, and ecology, through a different set of lenses. And we can bring these three together by design. And so we've developed, for our use, a, a fractal tool, which is uh, based on the Sierpinski gasket, which is a mathematical fractal, um, scaleless, basically. And, and you can, we can run around this fractal and ask questions like this one. What would it, be for, what would it mean for something to be 100% down in here? Well, this would be the economic corner of the economic corner. So what would the question in this box be? Can I make it and sell it at a profit? That would be the question. And the answer would be, if you can't do it, then you, you can't make a profit, then you're not in business. So let's proceed. The next would be here. This would be the equity corner of the economy triangle. What would it be? Well, this would be something like, are people earning a living wage? It's the social dimension of the economy. This would be the economic corner of the equity corner. What would the question there be? Uh, are men and women being paid the same for the same work, for example? Here would be a pure equity question. This was where we'd find racism or sexism pure social question. Um, this would be, are we producing products that have cancer? Are we producing workplaces where people are exposed to carcinogens? Is that fair from an ecological and social equity perspective? This question would be, are we causing climate change or polluting a river? Uh, something that is affecting the world and the world's ecology. This would be ecology, ecology. Are you following nature's laws? This would be what we call eco-effectiveness. And, and here, a, a little bit more on this in a few minutes. And this is what we call eco-efficiency, where I'm being efficient with my materials. Now, what we found is that often that people focus, when they talk about sustainable development, on this triangle down here. And so you end up with business for social responsibility. See, it's business first for social responsibility, and it ends up in this, this little triangle here. 
uh, you'll end up with eco-efficiency where we're doing the same things that we've been doing, but doing them more efficiently. That would be here. It's a business with an ecological uh, metric being brought to it. And profit, we understand. So what we're looking for is this broader definition of sustainable development that gets down to the nitty gritty in, ver in various sectors uh, and, and can incorporate them by design. Because what we found is that, that commerce is the engine of change and takes the leadership over the guardian in terms of most of the, the issues that we're going to be dealing with here today, uh, typically. And, and we find that commerce and the guardian are fundamentally different. This, this, uh, this distinction between the guardian and commerce was, was first articulated from my readings uh, by Jane Jacobs, the urban theorist, who, who pointed out that the guardian and commerce have fundamentally different characteristics. The guardian is the state. It's very slow, it's very serious, it's looking after the public wheel, and it reserves the right to kill, things like that, it reserves the right to regulate. The commerce, on the other hand, is very quick, it's very efficient, it's highly effective, and um, it is fundamentally honest, because you can't do business with somebody very long if you're not honest. And she points out that if you get the two mixed up, the guardian and commerce, you get what she calls monstrous hybrids. For example, the mafia would be a monstrous hybrid. It does business, but it reserves the right to kill. It's a problem. Right? So <laughs> let's keep these two things separate. But what we realize is that the guardian's job is to make sure that the public uh, is being protected or the public is being benefited by commerce. And in that sense, a regulation is a signal of design failure. From a design perspective, a regulation is a signal of design failure because it's the state saying, we have to step in because you're releasing cadmium or cobalt in your production or whatever it is they're regulating, and saying, we're going to have to regulate you because you're not behaving right because your design is wrong. And so it's an opportunity for design. And this is what I think is really important to understand. These are, a, a regulation is a signal of design opportunity as much as it is a signal of failure. And so this idea of taking opportunities and starting to design with them means we need a new framework for that design, a new kind of consciousness. And the question we're looking at in that context is, what does it mean to be, become native to place? What does it mean to be an indigenous person? And how many people in this room consider themselves indigenous people? What does it mean to be an indigenous person? Well. For, on one perspective, it means you're not leaving. You don't have plans on leaving. And a friend of mine who's a faith keeper of the Onondaga in uh, New York State, of the Onondaga peoples, was asked by the UN to come to an indigenous people's conference. And his response to the UN was, well, who's not indigenous? If we think about it, we're all indigenous to this planet, and we're not leaving. At the Hanford Nuclear Facility, where they store the plutonium that we make for our bombs and missiles, they had a symposium of scientists and semiologists, sign makers, to determine what kind of sign should they leave on the ground so that even an extraterrestrial 5,000 years from now wouldn't dare to dig where we've stored our nuclear waste. What kind of sign would it be? What an amazing design assignment. And the Yakima people who were there for another meeting bumped into some of the scientists, found out what they were doing, and started laughing. And said, you know, you don't need to worry about this. We'll tell them where it is. <laughs> they weren't leaving. So to have an indigenous mind means we're not leaving. And it means we become native to this place. And perhaps at this point in history, this is the place to which we've become indigenous. This amazing image from Apollo. Uh, showing us what the Earth looks like in outer, from outer space. And essentially, in 1969, the view from the moon uh, gave us a new consciousness. And away went away. Remember how we used to throw things away? Can somebody point to away? And what we realized is that we don't have an away. We're all here. We're here together. And it's an opportunity for us to take this awareness and craft a new design protocol. Now, unfortunately, in many instances, many of the designs that we have today are similar to those that we had in 1969. And so here we are, you know, decades later, 
tuning up some of the protocols that we've been enacting, uh, you know, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but just tuning them. And so um, the whole look from a sustainable development perspective is, uh, by design, is to look at the natural world for its millions of years of R&D and say, what are lessons we can learn from this kind of world? And, and obviously, as an architect, I can learn from these lines here. This is known as gravity. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. Uh, what other laws might there be in this picture? And so I, I wrote a book, as you heard, with Dr. Michael Braungart called Cradle to Cradle. And Cradle to Cradle is a, one of the first uh, plastic trade books. It's a plastic book. And the, the notion of the plastic book is to look at the idea that we're awash in plastics and that there's this astonishing opportunity for humans to make what we call technical nutrients as well as biological nutrients, more on that in a minute. And so the book is plastic to make a point that it could be made out of something that we have that can be infinitely reused and recycled. And that the idea of, of a tree, when you think about it by design at this point in our history, has to be looked at differently. If I asked you to design a tree, what would I be asking you to do? Design something for me that makes oxygen, sequesters carbon, can fix nitrogen, distills water, provides habitat for hundreds of species, accrues solar energy as fuel, makes complex sugars and food, changes colors with the seasons, creates microclimates, and self-replicates. How are we doing? <laughs> now, how many of us have designed something that makes oxygen lately? So why would you take something that's that sophisticated and do something as prosaic as smashing it, flattening it, and making flat white sheets that we write on? When Margaret Atwood, the Canadian poet, was, was informed that it took five square miles of forestry in British Columbia to do the New York Times Sunday edition every year, um, her response was, we write our history, our weekly history, on the skin of fish with the blood of bears. This idea that we would, we would take things that are making oxygen and use them for something as prosaic as a flat white sheet it can be questioned at this point in time. So we wrote the book Cradle to Cradle to look at a lot of ideas. And one of the ideas that we looked at was the one of being less bad is not being good. It's being less bad. So you're bad, you're just less so. And, and what we've realized is that with eco-efficiency, uh, a lot of people try to be less bad. They try, we try and make our buildings more energy efficient, which is a good thing to do but we find that in the end, they're still fossil fuel powered and nuclear powered and so on. We try to reduce our toxic releases, but we're still releasing toxins. We try to mitigate this problem or that problem, but what we're doing is mitigating problems that we're perpetuating, perhaps more efficiently, but, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, good. It's just less bad. And so it's like saying, we could leave here and go north to Canada or south to Mexico. If you found yourself going 100 miles an hour towards Canada, but we're supposed to be going to Mexico, it's only going to help us to slow down if we're turning around because we're going the wrong direction. And so a new direction is needed. And so the direction we look at is the cherry tree for inspiration in this context. And so we look at the cherry tree in the spring and we say, isn't it marvelous that there's this abundance of cherry blossoms? And we don't look at a cherry tree in the spring and say, oh, no, how many blossoms does it take? It's not very efficient. But we, but we love it. Thousands of blossoms so that two might sprout, uh, become seeds that sprout uh, new cherry trees. And so this idea that we would have an abundance of things that we celebrate uh, in, in, by design that return to cycles and stay within cycles is the fundamental premise of Cradle to Cradle. And we're looking at not only natural products, but also those things made by humans. And we're looking for effectiveness, not just efficiency. Because in that context, then growth is good. When we look at a cherry tree growing, we say growth is good. And one of the problems we have in the environmental world today is that when we talk about growth, we immediately think of asphalt as two words assigning blame. So if we, if we look at the world of, of, uh, the, of nature, what we recognize is the sun shines on the Earth's surface and things grow, and growth is good. When a tree grows, we consider that to be good. 
when a child grows, we call that good. And wouldn't it be marvelous if we could celebrate that growth? So let me, from a poetic perspective and from a designer's, uh, through a designer's lens, go back to the science of the last century and, and pull out a couple of events that, that I think are really important for design thinking today. And one would be the special theory of relativity, uh, and the other is the discovery of DNA. And if we look at the special, special theory of relativity, what we recognize is that, that C is a really big number, right? So if we square it, we get an almost infinite number, which means that if we multiply it by any positive, that it's effectively an infinite number. This is why Hiroshima disappeared and why Einstein was concerned, because a very small amount of M can yield an immense amount of E. And so if we look at this from a design perspective, just as, as a, use this as an advanced mnemonic to think about how we might think about our design on the planet, we could realize that the sun really is energy in physics, and that we have this nuclear reactor doing fusion 93 million miles away, it comes to us in eight minutes at the speed of light, and it's wireless. <laughs> okay, and we have thousands of times more energy than we need to operate human systems coming to the Earth's surface from this nuclear reactor. And so we, could, we can benefit and power human systems using this as the energy source in all of its various forms of renewable power and so on. So we probably will figure out how to solve the energy problem because we have energy income. We have income. Any business that doesn't have income doesn't thrive. But we have energy income, so we can take advantage of that. Right now, we're, we're depleting our ancient stored income. Uh, that's our capital of fossil fuel reserves. And as we take those and we burn them, and if you think about it from a design perspective, the silliest thing to do with a fossil fuel is burn it because it creates it, it moves it from being on the side of liability of assets to the side of liabilities with climate change and so on. So we really ought to be using our oil and our fossil fuels as sources for polymerization, for plastics, for pharmaceuticals, things like that, where it's highly valuable and very effective, and really rely on solar energy for our energy source. So, so that's the energy side. Now, on the chemistry, where we have the mass, we realize that from a just a poetic perspective, that the Earth is this inorganic uh, material that when struck with the energy from the sun and, and combination with water and so on and so forth, yields the phenomenon of biology, something that Einstein didn't deal with uh, um, in, in the formula. Um, but the idea that we would take the chemistry uh, of, say, all the chromium out of South Africa and put it into little products and distribute it all around the world where it ends up in little landfills or incinerators and, and destroys the quality of soil and water and air and things like that is a bad design. Uh, really, we want that chromium to be available to future generations in safe, healthy ways. And so wouldn't it be marvelous if we could develop a design protocol that allows us to do that? Then we can celebrate uh, the biology that it results from these interactions. And it, that brings us to looking at DNA. Now, when Watson and Crick discovered DNA in 1953, Crick went on for nine years until he gave a speech at the University of Washington entitled Of Molecules and Men, and went looking for what he called the nature of vitalism. What does it mean for something to be a living thing? And his conclusion was that it had to have three characteristics. It had to have growth, it had to have free energy, typically coming from sunlight, and it had to have an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. Growth, free energy from sunlight, and an open metabolism. These were the qualities of a living thing. Wouldn't it be marvelous if human designs could be like a living thing and we could celebrate their growth, celebrate the fact that they use free energy from sunlight, and that they have an open metabolism of chemicals that's safe and generative? Then the question would no longer be growth or no growth, the question becomes, what do we want to grow? And we can choose what we want to grow. And so instead of having these de facto plans where we see the things that we don't want to happen happening, we can see the things that we do want to happen happening by design. So how would we do that? What would our target look like and what would our trajectory be? Well, we've developed uh, a simple diagram to help us understand this, working with our clients, and essentially put forward a flight path that says, wouldn't it be marvelous if we could 
articulate what a 100% sustainable goal looks like, say you took renewable power as an example. Uh, you could take diversity, you could take uh, any issue you want, and you could just say we have a 100% goal here, and we have this trajectory. Now what we found is that efficiency, trying to do what we've been doing efficiently, is insufficient. Because if you're doing renewable energy, for example, you could save as much energy as you can, and you find yourself optimizing to a certain point when you are using as little of non-renewable power as possible, but you're still there because it's insufficient to get you there, efficiency. That doesn't mean it's a, that efficiency is a bad thing to do. It's obviously a critical thing to do because the more efficient you can be, the sooner you can be 100% renewably powered, for example, because the effectiveness agenda, the one that says we're renewably powered, uh, crosses the point of efficiency at some point, and the faster we can get to that efficient point, the sooner we can find the inflection point of crossing on our trajectory. Now, Peter Drucker, the management consultant, pointed out that it's an executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. It's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. So it's really important to understand that distinction. It's a manager's job to do it the right way, but it's the executive's job to do the right thing. Because if you're doing the wrong thing the right way, it's pernicious. Think about a Nazi, right? An efficient Nazi is worse than an inefficient Nazi, right? So the question becomes, are we doing the right thing first? Not, are we simply being efficient with the wrong thing? And that difference is leadership. That distinction between efficiency and effectiveness is really the place that takes us to where we want to go, and that's leadership. So what is eco-effective design? We use three design principles. Waste equals food, where we eliminate the concept of waste. So this could be rewritten food equals food. We eliminate the concept of waste. Use current solar income and celebrate diversity. And once we take on these design principles, then we find ourselves realizing that things fall into this question of cricks of an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. So we see that there are two fundamental metabolisms at this point. One is the biological metabolism, that of the natural world, us. The other is the technical metabolism, the one of our technologies that are out in the world. And so we can see things as nutrients within these metabolisms. So we see things as biological nutrients. So things like textiles should be designed that aren't going back into industrial cycles. They're, they can be designed to become safe compost and soil and, and safe for biological and for, uh, for ecological and human health. And, and so we call them biological nutrients. And so we parse products into, into a biological nutrient or a technical nutrient, a thing that can go back to industry forever in closed cycles. And what we really want of the technical nutrient is the service of that nutrient. We want, it, we want the service of this computer. I don't need to know that I own all these molecules. In fact, I don't even want to take responsibility for all these molecules. What I want is the service of the machine. We found ourselves working closely in the beginning of all this with the carpet industry, where we looked at carpets and said, wouldn't it be marvelous if carpets were seen as services, where you get the appearance, the acoustics, the comfort underfoot, the uh, cleanability, and so on, and you get it as a service. And when you finish with the carpet, the carpet company wants it back because it's a technical nutrient of their industry. And so they get to hold on to the customer while uh, refreshing their technical nutrition. So products as services is an important part of the technical nutrition story. Now, I'll just give you a bit of my background to give you a sense of how I got involved in all of this. I, I was asked in 1984 to design the national headquarters for the Environmental Defense Fund. And uh, the head of environmental defense was a lawyer. And, and he said, you know, we want to make sure all of our people in the office are safe for indoor air quality and, and uh, things like that. And we, we took this very seriously and for consultants who could help us and talk to our lawyers about what it meant to design in a world where we were full of, of, in, of lack of information. Because two things happened. One is we went looking for information and we couldn't find any. Uh, the state of the art indoor air quality in 1984, just for your information, 
was a company, a consulting company, that was primarily funded by the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company and was apparently doing research to show why there was no danger from secondhand smoke in the workplace. That was the state of the art at the time. And so, uh, so we went back to EDF and said, let's get on with this project because there's no information out there. And we started calling manufacturers and saying, what's in your products? Uh, what, what do they off gas and things like that? And the typical answer we got was it's proprietary, it's legal, please go away. And we've been at this now for 20 some odd years and we're still asking the same questions and we still get sometimes the same answer. But um, when we look at these issues, they become more and more central to the public experience. So here in 2000, on the cover of Business Week, but look at the language that's being used here. You know, is your office killing you, the danger, sick, things like that. We're trying not to cause a shrill response. We're trying to look at this very gimlet-eyed and focus on the redesign of things to be safe and healthy. That's the purpose of all of this. Because what we found is that most people don't know what they're making. Some of them will send you letters like this one we, we got where it says, we assure you we do not know all the components or formulations that comprise the systems we buy. This is true. The, the system of production in the world today is fraught with, with uh, unknowing activity. That there are people making things left and right where we don't know what's in them. Uh, we ask manufacturers every day, what's in your product? And their answers are either, we don't want to deal with this, or it just comes from our supplier. Why don't you talk to them? And then we talk to their supplier. And they get their resins from another company. And they say, well, it comes from them. It's a resin. This is what we use. And we don't know what's in it. We just know it works. And, and so there's a whole protocol ready to be uh, uh, worked on where we can optimize design by design. And it's important because if you look at buildings in California, look at this. You can walk into a building in California and be greeted by the following message. The state of California requires that we warn you that the property contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. These chemicals may be contained in emissions and fumes from building materials, products, and materials used to maintain the property, and so on and so on. Isn't that amazing? And we walk by these signs every day. And so what we see is that the first, inst the first information we get are that things are not not necessarily good out there, uh, and that we're warned. And that becomes the first act of the guardian, is to warn. What we need is new design, because the warnings are really quite serious. Look at this warning that appeared in the New York Times. This was on the cover of, uh, I think, the business section of the New York Times, this picture from the Basel Action Network, uh, of what's happening with electronics that are going to uh, China. This monitor apparently came from a, a hospital in Los Angeles. And so here we are taking care of people's health on one side of the ocean, on the other side of the ocean. This woman is about to expose herself to uh, toxic materials in uh, abundance. And, and this is our, our present design. So as we look at the whole notion of materials, what we realize is that the, the first signals are going to come from restricted substances like Proposition 65 or the REACH the REACH legislation in Europe will be res restricted substances. But really, as a species, what we could be looking at is let's do a full inventory of our chemicals and what we're, what we're making, and then let's do an optimization based on design. And so we've developed a protocol that allows us first to do inventory. And one of the first products we did was a textile in Switzerland where we looked at 8,000 chemicals in, this, in the fabric industry and using these intellectual filters I'm about to show you, eliminated 7,962. And we're left with 38 chemicals, which we used to develop the fabric, because that came out of our assessment. And these, this is our criteria for our assessment. Uh, no more cancer, disruption of our endocrine systems, genetic mutations, reproductive toxicity, or uh, birth defects. Uh, sensitizations and toxicities our additional criteria. Uh, here they are in English. Uh, cancer, hormonal mimicking, uh, chromosome mutations, and so on. So these are the first criteria that we look at. The next criteria are, are ecological health criteria. 
And so we want to look at environmental health of the product and its manufacturing. We want to see if it's toxic to vertebrates, to invertebrates, and to plants in water. Does it bioaccumulate? Does it biodegradate? Is it persistent? Does it have heavy metals and things like that? Uh, here they are in English. Poisonous to vertebrates, invertebrates, aquatic plants, and so on. And then we want to know how things are made and where they come from and where they go. And so we've developed a, a, a supply chain tool that can look at, at materials and where they come from, uh, how much energy is involved, how far they have to travel, do they involve testing of various kinds, do they affect the climate, stuff like that. And so we look at materials within this framework, starting with materials that are considered nutrients. We then look at products and how they're recycled, and then we design and work with systems that recover and recycle these nutrients. And so we give certifications now on products based on these criteria, as well as energy going toward renewables, water going to drinkable, and social responsibility being practiced by the or, uh, enterprise. And we rate materials rel relative to each other uh, and these absolute criteria based on green, little or no hazard, through to red, which is high hazard. And we've developed a a database now with thousands of chemicals so we can look at this is for example formaldehyde and we can profile it uh, based on these criteria so you'll notice that 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 it's carcinogenic uh, it develops as mutation possibilities reproductive toxin acute toxicities uh, irritation of, of uh, membranes and things like that so these products can be assessed and then we can work with them in the, in the formulation of, of both chemical, chemicals that are, are developed using these, these, these substances. We can also look at whole systems and how they take that chemical or that substance and use it within a whole system and whether it gets released or not. Because, you see, these materials don't know whether they're good or bad. You don't you look at cadmium, and you can't talk to cadmium and say, are you a good or a bad, right? Cadmium is a heavy metal. Uh, it's highly problematic. And exposed to people in the environment, it's a, it's a heavy metal. It's not a good thing. And so the idea of a NICAD battery is, from a design perspective, not a great idea because a child could hit that battery and knock it open and, and release the cadmium. It could go to a landfill. It ends up in your wastebasket. This is a bad use of cadmium. On the other hand, the use of cadmium for a solar collector that's owned by a company that is responsible for its products in, as products of service in closed cycles could use cadmium to make something that's infinitely reusable where the cadmium is sequestered from the, from the uh, biosphere. This, is, this would be an appropriate use of heavy metal. And so you, the, the cadmium good, cadmium bad really depends on its use. So we have uh, ways of weighing these uh, factors into the, into the assessments. So we have a supply chain tool so people can now communicate with their supply chains up and down, and we can do optimizations. So we take products that contain the problematic chemicals, and we try and design them so that they don't. Now, so far, some of the products that have been developed using these ideas and have, that have been certified include a fabric. This is one that will be used for the Airbus 380. Uh, it's a fabric we developed in Switzerland with a company there that is clean enough to eat. And this is good news for frequent flyers, because if you find yourself at 40,000 feet with a fiber deficiency, you can eat your chair. <laughs> now, um, the other thing that happened with the development of this product, which was amazing it, to us, was that we got a call saying that the water coming out of the factory after they put in all these chemical protocols uh, was coming out as clean as the water going in, which is Swiss drinking water. And so, the fact that you could drink the water coming out of a textile mill after dyeing and fixing baths and so on and so forth, imagine you could drink that water as drinking water in Switzerland. Um, this is what happens by design. And so the fabric, which used to have trimmings that were declared hazardous waste by the Swiss government, they couldn't bury or burn it in Switzerland by law. They had to ship it to Spain. And when you, when you have to ship away your trimming as hazardous waste, but you can sell what's in the middle, not only do we see the obvious downfall of the of the first industrial revolution thinking that's evolved into this system of making things with toxic materials and so on, but we realize that you're making hazardous waste. 
And so once, once this protocol was put into effect, the cradle-to-cradle the -cradle thinking, all of a sudden the disposal and trimmings all became mulch and compost for the local garden club. Uh, they get used for, for food or resource growth and the materials start to close their cycles by design safely. From the technical nutrient front, working with Shaw Industries, part of Berkshire Hathaway, um, we worked on a product of theirs called EcoWorks and EcoSolution Q, which is a, a carpet uh, textile that is one of the last textile industries in the United States, the carpet business, and developed a cradle-to-cradle -cradle carpet where the, the top is nylon six, which uh, goes back to caprolactam, chemical recycling, and then back to fiber. The, the underlayment comes out as a thermoplastic polyolefin, gets separated and recycled as an underlayment thermoplastic polyolefin. So the carpet can become a carpet again forever. So the relationship with the customer becomes one effectively of leasing the carpet to them. You sell them the carpet, you say you want it back whenever they're finished with it, and your relationship with the client and customer is maintained because you want the carpet back, they want to contact you when they finish with it because you're going to take it back, give them a discount on the new carpet, and that relationship gets maintained. And this is a really critical part of the equation, is the fact that you're maintaining your, your customer base. So carpet that can become carpet again forever, back through <coughs> chemical recycling or thermoplastic recycling. We've developed new products with Millican, which is a wall covering that's non-PVC. So it's polyolefin, recyclable polymer, without the carcinogenic concerns of PVC. Uh, window shades from Echo Shade that are uh, polyolefin. Furniture companies have taken up cradle to cradle uh, certification. Herman Miller, Steelcase, Hayworth all have certified chairs uh, that are designed to go back to cycles. We worked with the US Postal Service and now all the priority mailboxes are stamped with cradle to cradle. They've all been designed as biological or technical nutrients. And so the, the certification involves four le levels, basic, silver, gold, and platinum, with platinum obviously being the, the highest. Um, and it asks the questions of biological or technical nutrition. Do you have reverse logistics? This is the think chair from Steelcase. It com comes apart in five minutes um, with tools you could find in a kitchen drawer. Uh, do you have reverse logistics? This is the Shaw example. They have the 15th largest truck fleet in the country, uh, cycling their carpets back and forth. Uh, developing the idea of product of service. This is the Model U car, which we worked on with Ford. It's a concept car based on materials that would be infinitely reusable. Uh, do you use renewable energy? Steelcase Corporation just bought an 8 megawatt wind farm in Texas to power their production. So the furniture they're making is now wind powered. Is your water drinkable? This is the water in a textile mill making polyester fabric uh, before we arrived. And then here it is after uh, the protocols were put into effect. So once again, factories making clean water. And are you providing social fairness? This is an image from our factory we designed for Herman Miller uh, where they make uh, the furniture. And all the factory workers and the office workers come from different sides but share this public street full of training rooms, conference rooms, uh, cafes, things like that. So and a company very f well known for its social responsibility. So let's take a look at the, some of the issues that are facing us by design today. We know about the ones that are common, climate change, pollution of water, and things like that. But there are things that people may not be aware of that are happening that also affect our, our think, have to affect our thinking and give us a sense of urgency. This is known as the Pacific Gyre. Here's Hawaii, and you see this current that runs along the west coast and then out to sea, this low pressure area. Well, scientists a few years ago found out that there's six times as much plastic as plankton in the Pacific Gyre. Six times as much plastic as plankton. What else are we finding out? We're finding out that 48% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide that produced by humans since 1850 is in the oceans. And some people think, isn't that great? It's a sink. But what we've also heard from some of the scientists is that, that the pH of the oceans has historically been between 8.8 .8 and 8.2 pH, which we can tell from the Ross Ice Shelf cores. 
and that right now it's at 8.06, and it's expected that with the current carbon releases, it could get to 7.9 pH by the end of the century. At 7.9 pH, calcium carbonate goes into solution, and we drop out the bottom of the food chain. So, if this is our design to fill the oceans with plastics, to acidify the oceans, to cause climate change, to pollute rivers, so on and so forth, then we will end up with the results that we look like we intend to achieve, which is the destruction of living systems and the degradation of our habitat. On the other hand, if our designs turned around and we started to think of in positive ways to, us, to reinforce biodiversity, to uh, create safe, healthy things, what possibilities could there be? And so let me conclude with just some of the buildings that we've worked on. Um, you know, the, I present these humbly because I'm an architect and this is what I do uh, for a day job. So I want to show you what happens when you start to try and make buildings like trees or cities like forests. This is a project we did with Oberlin College um, over the last um, number of years. And during that time, it's been possible to make a building that produces more than 30% more energy than it needs to operate. We, we had to put solar collectors in the parking lot to achieve this, and we're, we're at 30% more energy than the project needs to operate. So a building that's fecund, a project that generates more than it needs to operate. This is a, an experiment uh, on the part of Professor David Orr at, at Oberlin, a terrific project operated by the students, and it purifies its own water using a living machine designed by John Todd. Um, so a building that makes more energy than it needs to operate uh, and purifies its own water as a, as a project. Here's a project near here. This is for, was for the Gap Corporation. It's now YouTube's headquarters. Um, this is a, a building that has a meadow of ancient grasses on the roof. That's what we did in the early 90s. And here we looked at the idea that from the bird's perspective, they would look down and say nothing happened. Um, wouldn't it be marvelous if they looked down and said, here's our ancient habitat, these are our nesting grounds, these are our bugs, these are our plants, and, and would see from the air this habitat, this is a roof. So in that building, uh, for the business people here, what we did was, was protocol all the different paybacks with simple paybacks and then, uh, and then bundled them all into a package of, of cost-benefit analysis working with the GAP. And we're able to look at each element for its cost-benefit and then put them all together and found that uh, the grass roof had lots of benefit and turned out to be one of its main benefits was the acoustic damping of the airplanes coming out of San Francisco Airport, that you can't hear them in the space. Uh, because of this, the roof. That was pretty delightful. Uh, the full daylighting and, fr and fresh air throughout the building. The windows open, which we thought was a good idea. The Wall Street Journal thought was news. Uh, they did an article about it. You know, windows that open are the latest office amenity was the title of the article. Uh, we, th we told the reporter that we're at a low point in Western civilization when a window that opens is news. Uh, here is a project for the Gap, I mean for um, Herman Miller, excuse me, uh, in Zeeland, Michigan, a factory um, where we're restoring the landscape, providing uh, places for, of work for, for people who work in their office, the factory. This is the factory floor. It's full of daylight, fresh air, views of the outdoors, and uh, the Beach Boys. And this, this sort of came out of a, of a conversation with the president of the company when we started the project. He said, uh, you know, he said, if my building was a suit of clothes, it wouldn't be Brooks Brothers buttoned down. It would be an Aloha shirt. And, and if it was a car, it wouldn't be a Mercedes with tinted windows. It would be a 1964 and a half Mustang convertible, probably pink. And what we realized is that they really didn't want to be working in southern Michigan. They wanted to be working in California. And so we decided to build California. So the building is full of daylight, fresh air, the sun, and the Beach Boys. And the productivity went up. Uh, by some accounts, it doubled. This is a corporate campus for Nike in Hilversum, Holland, that is uh, powered from the, from the earth geothermally, heated and cooled. Uh, the running track goes over the front door. 
This is Nike, just do it. Uh, the water is, is uh, collected and used for all the toilet flushing and for the landscapes and things like that. It's designed to be converted to housing in the future. So if it's ever not needed as an office building, it can become an apartment building. This is a project for Ford Motor Company uh, where we took the Ford Rouge, which looked like that, uh, and developed a new auto assembly plant, which looks like this. The, this is the roof. It's 10 and a half acres of habitat. And you'll notice these eggs here. These are from killdeer uh, species. And the killdeer arrived within five days of the roof going down. They were nesting on the roof, five days. Now, how do you get to do something like this? Well, we, we were given our assignment by Bill Ford and work with the Ford engineers and, and basically did cost-benefit analysis, did research, went to Europe, looked at the green roofs there, uh, found a roof that had been developed by the East Germans as a lightweight, cheap uh, camouflage for aircraft hangars in the Cold War and brought that technology to bear here so we could get a lightweight cost-effective, affordable roof. It's only an inch and a half thick. You see this is really just gravel with weeds. These are sedum, which is a non-invasive succulent, and it's a light coating of gravel on the roof. So it's affordable, and uh, these were the basic numbers. The cost of a conventional system of stormwater management for that site had already been laid out and drawn and budgeted at $48 million using four-foot concrete pipes, um, three chemical treatment plants, and the, the need for a whole bunch of UAW workers standing around praying it doesn't rain. Um, the systems that we showed you uh, using the green roof and so on were $13 million. So Ford saved $35 million day one uh, on this project using the ecological engineering versus conventional engineering. This is a concept design for a museum in the UK. It's six football fields big. This is the museum here. A museum for the first industrial revolution, commissioned by the National Museum of Science and Industry. Um, these are all conceptual projects I'm showing you now. This is a, a distribution center uh, for a large uh, retailer looking at how to take distribution and set it in the landscape near major highway and rail so that it's uh, hidden from view, it's quiet, and solar powered, absorbs particulates, and is fully daylit. This is a schematic for a, a, an airport that would be solar powered, where the rental cars would all be used as the battery storage system for the solar collectors and things like that. These I just wanted to show you. This is a picture uh, of a power light installation in uh, Germany. These are solar collectors in the field here. Give you a sense of what this starts to look like in the landscape. And then here is a project I'm doing with Brad Pitt where we've taken uh, a look at the Lower Ninth Ward of, of New Orleans and see if we could help out and developed a project called Make It Right where we've engaged 13 architects to do designs for this part of the world that are lifted up off the ground and, and made them available using a new cost structure model to the people who, who lived there before. So if you lived there before, you can have one of these houses built on your lot. Uh, they're solar powered. Uh, they're, we're reviewing all the materials for cradle to cradle as best we can. And it's a uh, project that's underway. We've built six houses so far of the 150 we hope to build in the phase one on these lots where people can come home. We call it Make It Right. We're experimenting with panelized housing, modular, and stick-built, just to see which are the most effective ways to deliver the houses. This is a house designed by Concordia Architects. Here's one by Kieran Timberlake. Um, this one by Graft uh, Architects out of Berlin. And then just to finish up with some scale work, um, as at Vantage Point Venture Partners, we're a venture fund behind uh, Bright Source Energy, which is, has a contract now for 900 megawatts of, of solar thermal power uh, in the desert. And 
we're looking at these how to deploy solar energy at scale in the United States and elsewhere. And we're also involved in uh, Project Better Place. How many of you have heard of Project Better Place? A few of you have. It's great. It's a project in, in uh, it'll start out in Israel, but is moving to Denmark uh, here immediately thereafter. But I just give you a sense of this from a design perspective. It was developed by uh, a businessman named Shai Agassi. And essentially, uh, what he was looking at is how to get Israel off of oil. And what he's determined is the best way to do it is to make sure that you use solar powered source for electricity, have electric cars, and get Renault, Nissan to make the electric cars in Israel and in Jordan, I think. I, I, I heard they might be doing it on the border of Israel and Jordan, which would be a really quite an amazing thing. Um, and then it got the government to agree to tax gasoline powered cars and, and not tax electric powered cars at the beginning so that there's this incentive program to move toward electric. Uh, and develop a program where if you get in your electric car, you can program where you want to go and there, your parking space shows up uh, in your car, tells you where to go, how to get there, and when you get there, you can plug in. And if you need to exchange your battery for longer range, there'll be stations available for plugging in. But the idea is to get Israel onto the electric car as fast as possible. But the fundamental point was that he, he didn't design it like saying, I want to see how to get electric cars in Israel, or I want to figure out how to get solar power into Israel or things like that. He, he had the simple goal of getting Israel off of oil. And so how many other amazing designs can business people come up with that are whole systems uh, like that when they have these uh, straightforward uh, large scale strategies to explore? So I'll just finish with a conceptual project we did in China. And why China? China will house hundreds of millions of people in the next 10 years. Uh, and this was a city in southern China, Luzhou, where we were asked to design the horizontal master plan for the extension of the city. It's a city of a million, which we did. And uh, this is the site neighboring the city. It's covered with sugar cane right now. And we thought about some of the statements that were coming out of Tiananmen Square and, and started to speculate on our own about what would it mean to have a waste equals food city? And what would it mean if we could have a city where the, all of the nutrients from the people were sent to resource recovery plants where we make fertilizer and, and methane gas for cooking. It turns out you can do about 20% of the cooking of a city uh, from its own sewage. And started to look at those kinds of systems and how we could take the water and purify it, purify it and make bamboo uh, for the doors and floors of the city. Uh, and how we could take that fertilizer back to the gardens and parks and, and, and grow things there. And this is not historically unknown. When I was a baby, I was born in Tokyo and I grew up in Hong Kong. And when I was a baby in, in Tokyo, right after the Second World War, we remember the, the honey wagons coming in at night to empty our latrines, take our sewage. My mother called them the honey wagons, taking out the night soil. And as little babies, you know, you'd love the stories about poop and stuff like that. So, you know, this was a great thing, the honey wagons taking our poop out to the farmers. And the farmers would take this, they'd compost it, and then they'd send back the vegetables, the tofu, the meats, and so on. And so this idea that things would close their cycles was not unknown uh, in this culture. And so we looked at what it would take to solar power a city uh, using local and uh, regional resources. And then, based on a statement by the Premier of China, who said that if China continues its current urbanization at the current rate, they will lose 20% of their farmland by 2020. We thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take the soils and lift them up onto the roof of the city? So imagine Paris with farms on the roofs. So we tried to imagine what it would look like to have a city like that where all the people who live in these apartments could garden on their roofs and we could maintain the um, more and more health. And that's why when we see asphalt, we, we worry because it destroys this fundamental relationship. And so um, we posited this image as a way of celebrating that idea that even ci cities could become fecund, not just in their gardens, uh, but on their rooftops. So to close, what is our intention as a species? Our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, 
water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. And our question is, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sure some of you have places that you must get to at this hour, but uh, uh, I'll be here for some questions, if there are any. Sorry? Oh, there are microphones in the aisles on either side. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Uh, my name is Elena Wilson. I'm from the University of North Carolina. Um, and as you know, the Green Bridge Project, which your firm designed, uh, has and will continue to displace a black community that's called the Northside Neighborhood Home for more than a century. And so I'd like to know how, in this specific case, you personally reconcile the detrimental social impacts of gentrification with your vision for sustainable development. That's a great question. Um, on, that, on that project, um, the developer, Tim Tobin, has uh, worked with the local community in depth to, to engage and to, uh, to seek to reconcile the history and the opportunities that are possible in that neighborhood. So we've been working with Tim and relying on Tim and his work on that issue. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Right. It's a great question. Um, we, I think that we hope that the the kinds of issues that we're dealing with, especially related to energy, uh, are the kinds of things that are going to be essential to uh, economic prosperity in the minds of of the new administration, whatever administration comes to bear here. Uh, we're seeing it in places where there is capital still to invest in these kinds of strategies, for example, in the Middle East. One of the uh, important things that we've seen happening, which I think will continue to happen, is that if you look at the, in 1973, with the um, first oil shock, they, they took the price, the price of oil uh, and took it up to $35 a, a barrel. And people asked Sheikh Yamani what they were going to do when they dropped, uh, when, when other alternatives to oil came into cost effectiveness. And they said, well, we'll drop the price of oil and destroy those investments. And essentially that's what's happened on a decade basis, decadal basis. Uh, and that the alternatives to oil have all been affected by this price of oil and its volatility in the low end. What's happened now is that with oil being free to run up to $100 a barrel plus in some uh, periods, um, the, the oil producing countries have recognized that the same way that they could have stultified those alternative investments, they can enhance their own portfolios by investing in those things once the price of oil floats. And so with India and China coming on board as oil consuming countries, uh, all of a sudden you're, you're seeing countries like Abu Dhabi put $15 billion into new cities that are carbon neutral, investing in all the technologies that will make them carbon neutral because they recognize that they can take the money they're making from oil and invest it in renewables and, and cost effectively. So I think that that, that a lot of the investments we're seeing, especially in the energy sector, will continue to happen simply because the price of oil uh, will probably not drop to any of its historical lows again in the near future.
Yeah, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> the answer to that, you're right. Uh, they're right. And um, what we're doing is the first thing is trying to, this is why, you know, this is so uh, humbling. This work is, it takes you to really hard places. Um, what we're looking at is how to get the chemicals right in the first place so that they're worth recycling. That's, that's one of the first things we're doing. And we're taking our database and, and expanding it daily and, and developing ways that um, the, the people who make the, these kinds of materials can, get, can actually have something worth taking back. Um, the, the second thing is to develop the take back systems themselves so that uh, we're working with an electronics manufacturer right now developing a closed, closed loop system for them. Uh, so that they can get the materials back as part of their value proposition so to the customer. And so I think what we found in the earliest instances of this, starting back in 1994, 1995, um, is that the, the key is the, is the uh, reverse logistics, is to get the stuff back. And then you can start to work with it. And the value of the stuff you get back is really low. In fact, it may even be a cost. Imagine a company like Nike making a shoe and wanting it back. Um, when they get the old shoe back, you know, the question could be, what's the value of these technical nutrients? And the value would be very low. It could be pennies. It could even be a cost because you have to handle it. And, um, and what we've realized in the first instances, like we did with the carpet, is that the value of the technical nutrients themselves, per se, is very low. Um, it will go higher in the future, we believe, given the costs of raw materials. But in the, in the present, it's very low. And that the real value is actually the customer coming back for a new product and returning their old product for the recycling program. So if you look at a company like Nike, which is basically a design and marketing company, because they don't manufacture themselves, they have their stuff manufactured uh, for them. Um, the, they, they spend 70% or whatever it is of their budgets uh, attracting people to come to their product. And so what we realize is that if you could get your customers to return to you because you're coming back as part of the technical nutrient flow, the value proposition is probably higher in, in the customer return than it is in the materials themselves. So when you're designing the products, I think if you think hard about what the reverse logistics value proposition would be, and you can create a relationship between the customer and the producer, uh, you'll be ahead of the curve on this one. Because the actual materials themselves um, you know, probably don't cost justify on the first instance. So you need that relationship to get the reverse logistics. You're welcome. Um. Uh, the next administration, whichever one it is, that gets in is probably going to need a primary person to go to for environmental issues. Who would you like to see and how much, what level of cabinet uh, position would you like to see? What level of effort would you like to see at the federal stage? I'd like to see someone like uh, John Holdren from Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School of okay. Government. Um, be a go-to person. He's uh, been involved in the whole question of nuclear proliferation as well as the environment uh, from a very uh, deep perspective. He co-authored uh, uh, co with um, some very impressive people, including Paul Ehrlich here. Um, so I think people like that at that level would be really terrific if it could be approached. And what, what level of effort would you like to see from the federal government? Well, I think on the energy front, you know, we ought to take a really hard look at, at what is being proposed by, well, Al Gore's got his proposal right now, which is energy independence in 10 years, being a 100% renewably powered nation in 10 years. That's his sort of wild goal, big, big goal. Uh, this, uh, this uh, T. Boone Pickens protocol that's being put forward is quite fascinating. 
uh, looking at the Midwest as the Saudi Arabia of wind. I think that's an interesting thing to be looking at pretty hard. Uh, I think that the big thing for the administration is probably to uh, find a way to allow the entrepreneurial spirit of the country to be released in, in ways that allow for large-scale deployment of renewables. Um, I think that that will include looking really hard at how to get the grid available to those large-scale renewables in ways that are effective for this distribution. Um, so I think that would be really important. I think the energy efficiency initiatives that are underway now should be strengthened. Uh, we could have a long way to go with that. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities for energy efficiency. It's the cheapest harvest of, uh, of uh, what uh, Amory Lovins called megawatts that is out there. So that would be on the energy front. On the materials front, I think it would be really exciting to see uh, cradle-to-cradle type initiatives happening. We're already seeing one in California, which is a harbinger of things to come with their green chemistry initiative, which uh, I gather got approved uh, in the last two weeks. So I would look really hard at the green chemistry initiative in California as a signal of what might want to be done at a federal level. So